The archaeologists and the prehistorians, people are looking at that, have failed to take into account the severity of these events we're talking about. You don't realize the extent of the total remodeling of this planetary surface that took place. Because the question always is, where are the artifacts? Where's the pottery? Where is the, the evidence that this civilization existed? Randall Carlson's theory about advanced ancient civilizations is truly fascinating and a bit of a departure from what we usually hear in mainstream archaeology. He's suggesting that highly sophisticated societies might have existed tens of thousands of years ago, way before the traditional cradles of civilization like Mesopotamia, Egypt, the Indus Valley and China came into the picture. Imagine civilizations thriving before or even during the last ice age, which wrapped up around 11,700 years ago. That idea alone pushes back the conventional timeline of human development by several thousand years. Now, when you look at the evidence Carlson brings to the table, it's primarily centered around those massive and mystifying megalithic structures scattered across the globe. Take the pyramids of Giza, for example. Their alignment with the stars of Orion's belt and the precision of their construction is just mind-blowing. Or Stonehenge with its solstitial alignment standing there on the Salisbury Plain. Two of these shafts um, go all the way through the body of the pyramid and exit on the outside and, and actually point at particularly significant stars. These structures suggest that the people who built them had a far more advanced understanding of astronomy than we usually give them credit for. Carlson dives into the engineering and architectural skills of these ancient builders. He talks about how they constructed these massive stone structures, some involving stones weighing several tons. Just think about the logistics of transporting and precisely placing these enormous stones over great distances. It indicates a level of engineering know-how and physical physics that seems way ahead of their time. Now moving on. Randall Carlson's theory about ancient civilizations is absolutely something different, isn't it? He really makes you think about the roots of our history in a new way. Just consider the megalithic structures scattered all over the world. When you count for the rise of sea level and the, the isostatic subsidence of the sea floor, it's not at all implausible that you had a large island complex in the mid-Atlantic Ocean. Carlson sees these as evidence of advanced prehistoric civilizations. The Great Pyramid of Giza, for example, is made up of over two million stone blocks, each weighing tons, and they're all placed with incredible precision. It's not just about the sheer size, but the sophistication in their construction. And it's not just in one place. These megalithic structures are everywhere, from the stone circles in Europe to the pyramids in Egypt and Mesoamerica. Carlson points out that the similarities in construction techniques and astronomical alignments across different cultures hint at a possibly shared or globally distributed source of knowledge. It's like these ancient builders were all tapping into the same advanced understanding, which is pretty mind-blowing to think about. Now, where it gets even more intriguing, is how Carlson links the disappearance of this advanced knowledge to catastrophic events. He often refers to the younger Dryas impact hypothesis, suggesting that a comet impact might have triggered drastic climatic changes at the end of the Ice Age. You may have periods of time where you have multiple impacts occurring over a short period of time associated with the destruction and disintegration of large comets. Imagine massive flooding, climate shifts, and entire civilizations collapsing. It's like something out of a movie, but Carlson suggests it could be what wiped out these advanced societies and their knowledge. But here's the thing. He thinks this lost knowledge didn't just vanish. According to Carlson, it lived on in myths, legends, and religious texts, which he sees not just as stories, but as historical records. Take the flood myths, for example, like Noah's Ark or the Epic of Gilgamesh. Carlson sees these as allegorical references to actual historical events, like massive post-glacial flooding. He believes that remnants of knowledge from these advanced civilizations were passed down through generations albeit in a fragmented and symbolically encoded way. Moving back to megalithic structures, Randall Carlson's work on the astronomical alignments of megalithic structures is like peeling back layers of history to reveal the deep astronomical knowledge of ancient civilizations. Take the megalithic temples of Malta, Hagar Kim and Manadra, for instance. These structures aren't just old, they're among the oldest freestanding structures in the world, dating back to around 3,600. 3200 BC. 
What's really remarkable about them is how they demonstrate an intricate understanding of celestial movements, particularly the solar cycle. When you look at these temples, especially during the equinoxes, it's like watching a celestial dance choreographed by ancient architects. At Menajdra on the equinoxes, the sunlight filters through a specific aperture, illuminating an inner stone slab. It's this incredible precision that highlights how the builders weren't just stacking stones, they were aligning them with celestial events, marking the change of seasons with architectural precision. But it's not just about alignments. The architectural design itself is a marvel. Some reference to such an event can be traced in many of the legends and myths surrounding these stars that have come down to us from nations far removed from each other. The layout of the temples seems carefully planned to align with the sun's position at significant times of the year. For example, the main axis of Hagar Chim is almost perfectly oriented to where the sun rises during the solstices. It shows a level of planning and understanding of the sun's movements. And then there's the construction itself. We're talking about huge megaliths, each weighing several tons, placed with such accuracy that they align with celestial events. It wasn't just a matter of brute force, it required sophisticated knowledge of astronomy and construction techniques. Plus, they used local limestone, which is abundant in Malta. The complexity of these temples goes beyond just their size or the weight of the stones. They have multiple apses, altars and intricate carvings, all forming part of a complex architectural design. The series of semicircular chambers connected by a central corridor and their alignment with specific astronomical events the pyramids of Giza, especially the Great Pyramid, the precision with which these pyramids align to the cardinal points of the compass is just mind-boggling. Think about it. The Great Pyramid, built for Pharaoh Khufu around 2580-2560 BC, is aligned almost perfectly north, south, east and west. The northern side aligns to within a fraction of a degree of true north. Considering the era it was built in, that's an incredible feat of geometry and astronomy. The construction techniques themselves are a mystery. The ancient Egyptians might have used stars or the sun's path to find true north, which implies they had advanced surveying techniques and a deep understanding of angles and straight lines. It's impressive when you consider the tools and technology available at the time. Then there's the fascinating Orion correlation theory. This theory suggests that the layout of the three main pyramids at Giza mirrors the stars in Orion's belt. Proponents like Robert Beauval believe this alignment was intentional, reflecting a belief in the connection between the heavens and the afterlife. They speak of these two regions of the sky, the southern sky with the stars of Orion, and there's the move one slide up. Here's a nice view of them. They're pristine, by the way. It's really eerie how they carve those texts by hand, and some of the details is extraordinary. With Orion associated with Osiris, the god of rebirth and the afterlife, the pyramids in this view were not just tombs, but also celestial maps and gateways for the pharaoh's soul to the afterlife. The smallest pyramid, Menkaure's pyramid, is slightly offset, mirroring the offset of the smallest star, Mintaka, in Orion's belt, which adds another layer of intrigue to this theory. The design of the pyramids also incorporates alignments with the sun and specific stars and constellations. For example, certain shafts within the Great Pyramid align with particular stars. These could have been more than architectural features. They might have held spiritual significance, possibly serving as pathways for the pharaoh's soul to the stars. Also, on specific days of the year, the sun sets between the pyramids, creating a visual spectacle likely significant in ancient Egyptian ceremonies. Now one of the most known megalithic structures. Would it be fair to say that there's an element of a rediscovery of a yes. lost technology from the past? I think it would be fair to say that, yes. Stonehenge, out there on the Salisbury Plain in Wiltshire, England. What's particularly fascinating about Stonehenge is its astronomical alignment and how it was constructed. The way it lines up with the summer solstice is probably what it's most famous for. On the longest day of the year, the sun rises right over the heel stone, which is set just outside the main stone circle. As the sun comes up, its rays shoot straight through the entrance and light up the center of the circle. Stonehenge also aligns with the winter solstice and possibly other celestial events. During the winter solstice, the sunset is framed by those massive stone trilithons, and some experts think it might even line up with lunar phenomena, which just adds another layer to how the builders understood both the sun and the moon's movements. When you think about how Stonehenge was built, it's even more mind-blowing. 
The final form was completed around 2500 BC, but it was built in phases over about 1,500 years. The main part of the monument is made up of these huge sarsen stones arranged in a circle, and there are smaller blue stones that were brought over from Wales. That's over 150 miles away. And then there's the layout of the stones. They're set up in this specific geometric pattern with an outer circle, an inner horseshoe arrangement, and those trilithon structures. The precision in the layout and how the stones are oriented show a really deep understanding of geometry and astronomy. It's not just a bunch of rocks placed randomly. Everything at Stonehenge is set up with purpose and meaning, which makes you wonder a little bit, doesn't it? Definitely a hall of records containing uh, a sort of time capsule from a forgotten episode in human history. What is concealed there touches on the fundamental mystery the mystery of the immortality of the human soul. The concept of the Hall of Records is an intriguing blend of mysticism, archaeology, and speculative history, largely stemming from the visions of Edgar Case and the theories of Graham Hancock. Edgar Case, known as the Sleeping Prophet, was an American clairvoyant who claimed to access a wealth of knowledge in a subconscious state. During his trance-like states, Casey spoke of a hall of records, a repository containing the wisdom and history of a long-lost civilization believed to be Atlantis. This mythical island nation, famously mentioned in Plato's dialogues, was, according to Casey, a hub of advanced technology and spiritual knowledge. Casey had no apology for the limits of his psychic ability, though he continued to make world predictions he never considered himself a prophet. Casey's visions placed one of these halls beneath the Sphinx in Egypt, suggesting it held records from Atlantis, including cosmic knowledge and advanced technologies. He also mentioned two other locations, one underwater near the Bahamas and another in the Yucatan region, linked to the ancient Maya. His description of Atlantis painted it as an advanced civilization, aware of its impending doom, who created these halls to preserve their knowledge for posterity. Enter Graham Hancock, a writer known for his alternative historical narratives. Hancock has been deeply interested in the Hall of Records, seeing its potential discovery as supporting evidence for his theories of a prehistoric advanced civilization. I think the key thing is we're, we're looking at technologies that are not the same as ours. Yes. And that's yes, partly that's why archaeologists can't see them, because they're looking for us in the past, and they're not open to the possibility that there are whole other kinds of technology that could be used. He believes this civilization existed during the last Ice Age and was lost to a global cataclysm. For Hancock, the Hall of Records isn't just a mythical concept, but could be a real repository of lost knowledge. He speculates that it might contain detailed astronomical data and advanced technologies that could challenge our understanding of ancient civilizations. Hancock's theories suggest that such a discovery could bridge the gap between myth and historical fact, providing tangible proof of a once globally influential civilization with profound knowledge in astronomy and architecture. We're looking at the clues that lead to specific locations. That shaft which led to that doorway was always a clue. The opening of that shaft was sealed until 1872. The last five inches of stone over the mouth of that shaft had been left deliberately in place. Now moving on, the discovery of the sunken city of Thonis Heracleion off the coast of Egypt has been a remarkable window into the past, unveiling a wealth of information about the ancient world. Located strategically near the canopic mouth of the Nile, north of Abukir Bay, Thonis Heracleion was a pivotal maritime hub. Its position was crucial for navigation and commerce, bridging the Nile River with the vast Mediterranean Sea. The city, with its natural harbour shielded by a chain of islands, thrived as a major port, a testament to its urban and architectural prowess as indicated by the remnants of a network of canals, docks and temple complexes. Rediscovered in the early 2000s, Thonis Heracleion had been submerged and lost for centuries before French underwater archaeologist Frank Godio and his team, employing advanced techniques like sonar scanning, brought it back to light. This monumental discovery, made in collaboration with the Egyptian Ministry of Antiquities, ensured that the findings were well documented and preserved. The utilization of cutting-edge technology in underwater archaeology has been pivotal in mapping the city's layout and recovering artifacts, offering us a clearer picture of its past. Dating back to at least the 12th century BC, Thonis Heracleion was more than just a city. 
It was a bustling hub during its heyday in the late Pharaonic and early Greco-Roman periods. As a significant commercial center, it played an integral role in the Mediterranean trade network, dealing in goods like grain, papyrus, precious metals and spices. But its significance wasn't limited to trade alone. The city was a cultural melting pot, blending Egyptian, Greek and Roman cultures. This amalgamation was reflected in the diverse range of artifacts unearthed, including statues and inscriptions, showcasing various artistic styles and cultural influences. The city's religious significance cannot be overstated. With its large temples and sanctuaries dedicated to numerous Egyptian gods and goddesses, Thonis Heraclean was a spiritual beacon, especially known for hosting the annual Mysteries of Osiris rituals. Politically, too, it was a powerhouse, serving as a primary entry point for foreign diplomats and traders to Egypt, and playing a crucial role in international relations. Its administrative significance was also marked, given its role in tax collection and governance. The Society for American Archaeologists claimed that they could absolutely for certain be sure that there was no lost civilization during the Ice Age. They knew it was a fact, and if there had been any civilization, they would have found it, right. and they would have published it. The archaeological treasures unearthed from the sunken city of Thonis Heraclean have been absolutely incredible, each offering a unique glimpse into the life and times of this ancient Egyptian city. For starters, the discovery of over 64 ancient shipwrecks is remarkable. It's not just the number that's impressive, but also their state of preservation. These wrecks are like time capsules, giving us a real sense of the maritime activities that once buzzed in this port. They tell us about the shipbuilding techniques of the era, how these vessels were designed, constructed, and the materials used. The diversity of ships, from grand cargo vessels to smaller boats, paints a picture of a bustling harbor engaged in a wide range of maritime endeavors, and the cargo remnants, including amphorae and various trade goods, speak volumes about Thonis Heraclean's extensive trade network. Then, there are the anchors, about 700 of them. This is unheard of in underwater archaeology and speaks to the sheer scale of the port's operations. The size and design of some of these anchors suggest they were used by large, heavy ships, showcasing the port's capacity and technological prowess at the time. The materials used Stone, metal, reflect not just the resources available but also the level of craftsmanship and maritime technology of the period. The statues they found are simply awe-inspiring. Imagine coming face to face with a 16-foot tall statue underwater. These statues, representing gods, goddesses, pharaohs and perhaps significant city figures, give us a window into the religious and political life of Thonis Heracleon. Made from granite and diorite, they're not just huge, they're also beautifully crafted, a testament to the city's wealth and its cultural significance. Gold coins are another major find. The substantial quantity of coins discovered indicates the city's economic prosperity. These coins span across various eras and rulers, providing a timeline of the city's prominence and its connections in trade. They're solid proof of Thonis Heraclean's active role in regional and international trade networks, there are, you have to be careful when you look at underwater structures. You have to look at all the conditions that have led to their submergence. And, and in some cases, it's very clear that they've been underwater for a very, very, very long time indeed. Thonis Heraclean is like a treasure trove for anyone fascinated by ancient civilizations. The way this city was laid out tells us so much about the people who lived there and their advanced understanding of urban planning. They had a network of canals, roads and buildings all systematically arranged, which is pretty impressive when you think about how old this city is. These canals were crucial for transport and trade, functioning like water-based roadways. It's amazing to imagine boats navigating these waterways as part of daily life in the city. Then there's the city's architecture, particularly its temples. Thonis Heraclean wasn't just a trading hub, it was a religious center too. The temples there were dedicated to various deities like Amun and Heracles, showcasing the religious diversity of the time. These weren't just simple structures, they were architecturally grand with large columns, statues and intricate carvings. It's fascinating to think about how these temples were not only places of worship, but also centers for social and cultural activities. They played a significant role in the daily life of the city. The city's role as a cultural hub is further highlighted by the artifacts found there, which show a blend of Egyptian, Greek and Roman influences. I think we're looking at something from Alexandria here. 
Yes. Yeah, we are. We are. I've dived there as well. That's inundated not because of sea level rise, but because of subsidence of the Nile silts. Uh, Moving on to more underwater locations in Egypt, Cleopatra's Palace in Alexandria is truly a fascinating subject, especially when you dive into its location, historical context, and the treasures it held. Nestled in the eastern harbour of Alexandria, the palace was not just any royal residence. It was located in the most prestigious part of the city, known as the Royal Quarter. This was where the heart of political and cultural activity in the Ptolemaic period beat the strongest. Now think about Cleopatra Sevevan, the figure to whom this palace belonged. She was the last pharaoh of the Ptolemaic kingdom, renowned for her intelligence, charisma and her liaisons with figures like Julius Caesar and Mark Antony. The palace, from its architecture to its contents, was a reflection of her power and prestige. Imagine a grand structure combining traditional Egyptian and Hellenistic architectural elements with lavish decorations and intricate detailing. It wasn't just a place to live, it was a statement of power and culture. The palace was probably filled with lush gardens and courtyards, offering a peaceful retreat in the midst of a bustling city. And given Alexandria's reputation as a center of learning and scholarship, it wouldn't be surprising if Cleopatra's palace housed extensive libraries and study areas. This would have been a place where the intellectual elite of the period gathered. The grand reception halls in the palace would have been venues for diplomatic events and political discussions, playing a crucial role in the international politics of the era. The artifacts and architectural elements discovered from this palace are like pieces of a historical puzzle. Statues, possibly depicting Cleopatra, Ptolemaic rulers and Egyptian gods, made from materials like granite and basalt, give us a glimpse into the artistic excellence of the time. The columns and other architectural fragments found at the site tell a story of opulence and artistic fusion, where Greek and Roman influences blended with Egyptian motifs. And then there are the sphinxes, symbolizing royal power and religious significance, perfectly illustrating the cultural synthesis that was characteristic of the Ptolemaic period. These discoveries are not just about Cleopatra's personal tastes, they provide a deeper understanding of the Ptolemaic society during her reign. The blend of Egyptian, Greek and Roman elements found in the palace's architecture and artifacts reflects the rich cultural diversity and exchange that occurred under Cleopatra's rule.